everybody. It's Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. We're back at our Fountainhead Studios here on Westwood Street in Port Coquitlam. Uh, we are on the, uh, on the unceded territory of the Coquitlam First Nations. And for those who wonder, what does unceded mean? It means we have really no treaty. So we want to thank the, uh, the First Nations for the ability to kind of uh, videotape and use this space for bringing you updates about the municipal 2022 election, which starts, of course, on October 15th. So you got to vote. And today we have Councillor Makura has come into the studios. Uh, Councillor, welcome to the studios. Thank you for having me. I call it a studio, but really it's like a little fake studio, a little podcast corner here. But a little comfy room. <laughs> a little comfy room. <laughs> so, so obviously, you know, if people know you, you're, you've got signs all over the place. You know, you've worked really hard to get on your first term, and, and you, they've just completed that. But if I just sort of came into town for the first time, uh, and I don't know you, could you give us uh, those folks a sense of who you are? Sure. Um, myself, I've lived in Port Coquitlam for 30 years. Uh, my husband and I chose Port Coquitlam to raise our family. And uh, it just keeps growing and good things keep happening. Um, and I'll just mention some things, for instance, that our council has done in my last term. Uh, we've um, built over 500 non-market affordable rental units. We stopped a developer from uh, evicting over 100 tenants. Now we've got one of the toughest dem eviction bylaws in British Columbia. Uh, during COVID, we opened up uh, drinking alcoholic beverages in certain parks. And uh, uh, we built our rec center on time, on budget, during a global pandemic. Uh, and now we have uh, the ability for our seniors, super seniors, to be able to exercise for free. Um, and super seniors like someone over 80, because my neighbor's over 80 and he was excited. So. Oh, there you go. Well. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. No, we made One less spot on the bench press. Yeah, so I mean, they've paid their time and their dues to our city, and it's going to keep people out of the um, medical system. So it's a good thing. Um, and there's so many things that we just keep working on. We've invested three and a half million to flood protection and climate action. And I basically, we're the envy of many cities because of all the results we've delivered. So, you know, uh, the first time you ran, you didn't get, did, you didn't get in. You worked, you know, some people say you knocked on every door in Poco and then the second time around you got in, um, which is the secret. If you knock on every door, we're going to get to know everybody. So, but, but of course, when you got on council, two years in, you've got COVID. And you talked about some of the things that, that's happened there. But um, what, what is COVID, uh, you know, how, how is the city going through COVID? And, and sort of how did you sort of uh, handle that uh, on behalf of the citizens? So the biggest thing that the city produced during COVID, in council's opinion, was that the rec center was completed on time, on budget, and during that global pandemic. But also, uh, we made a difference with businesses and with people that were lonely. So, for instance, that's how, <clears throat> excuse me, we've got the ability now to, <clears throat> excuse me, drink alcoholic beverages in certain parks. Many of our residents live in townhouses or apartments, had nowhere to go, they were trapped. And even one fellow wrote us an email after and said he was so happy that he was able to toast to the bride in Lions Park. So, um, uh, and the parks are busy, right? I mean, I, I, I live next to Citadel Park there, well, the new water park. And uh, before the water park, it was okay. With the water park, it got a little busier. But with the sort of the, now you drive by there, and it's literally like uh, tents and people camping and stuff and having, I call a, a all day picnic in there. So it seems to change the vibe a little bit. Yes, and we have um, music, more music going on in, in the parks. We've got, uh, our like McAllister Street um, party that we just had a couple of weeks ago. So we've started to open up no more. Now COVID is still on, but not quite as severe. And that was wonderful. You could see the kids getting face painted and uh, performing artists on the street. And there's just so much more that's coming to Poco that I definitely want to be a part in. I'm very uh, endeared to the arts, as you're aware. I'm, I'm the designate for arts, culture, and heritage as, as one of my designations. And I just feel that um, we've, we're coming along. We've still got more to do, but uh, for instance, uh, COVID also produced the um, um, hydro wraps now that you see on uh, hydro boxes 
so it's going to prevent uh, vandalism. And the artwork that we got for these projects was set, get, uh, sent in to us from uh, different people in the community. Pictures, there was even, remember when people painted all the rocks? Yeah. All of those rocks, uh, one person took a great a uh, great picture of them, and now we've got them encapsulated on <clears throat> one of these boxes. Yeah, I, I, know, I know in the overpass though, usually you've got to have the heart banner. It was kind of like the rocks, the heart rocks, and then also the, the wraps you talked about. I think there was a whole bunch of banners across the overpass. And I know I saw one of your posts where you had a, we have an Elvis impersonator who was presenting and you seemed well excited about that so and, and shared it with everybody. So how, yeah, how, how did that make you feel? Yes, that's wonderful. Um, one of the ladies in, in my neighborhood, uh, she would often have um, Elvis come and perform on her front yard. And the neighbors would come by and space their, their um, chairs out and be able to watch. And it brought people together that were feeling very isolated. Yeah. Personally, so, I got an um, a, um, uh, e-bike during COVID. Oh and yeah, I found that was, that was very good because you could go and explore our trails better. and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was um, something that I feel many more people could still invest in if, if they're looking for a different mode of transportation. Um, so how is the city going to try to leverage that sort of non, a different form of transportation? Are you, are you, is it anything on the table for that? There is something in the works I'm hoping, and that's for along Kingsway, where we're going to have a multi-use path, where it's going to go hopefully up and something safer over uh, between the south side and the north side to, right. to connect uh, the bike routes uh, so so that would work out better and as you noticed perhaps on uh, Prairie there's the new MUP multi-use path that's shared by bikers and uh, well, cyclists and uh, pedestrians things on wheels so yeah I know the e-bikes go quick but uh, and I did notice a couple things when you go for a walk in Poco one is the some some of the entrances to the the, I guess the dike have a number and there's some signs saying, you know, politely yell or ring a bell or something, but it's very small, but it's still there. Yes, and that was actually implemented um, because in some places when you're going to call 911, you don't know where you are. Mm. So you'll see a little reader board that you can see and it'll give you um, something you put your phone up and that would be able to help uh, uh, them be able to locate where you are. Yeah. So, and also uh, for cyclists and people that are walking, there's now signs that identify honk, um, you know, or beep or yell so that you don't have collisions and things. So we're yeah. trying to keep as safe as we can um, in regards to more types of transportation. So if you live in Poco, you've noticed these bumps in the road. There seems to be more bumps in the road. And I know Prairie was a problem for a lot of people. I used to live near Prairie. But I, I know when I drove down it, I thought, oh my God, this is this construction's crazy. So, uh, reason for the bumps? So, the, the speed bumps for the majority have been a good thing. They've slowed the traffic down. In 2018, when I knocked on doors, some of the biggest, well, the biggest concern then, and it actually still is now on the doorstep, is traffic and how fast it goes or in certain streets. And the speed humps have definitely made a difference um, in front of school zones. Uh, we've just got one now in front on my street on Larch Way. That's going to slow the traffic that's going to go down to Birchland Elementary, for instance. And I was advocating for that for about, I don't know, six years. So it's blanketed now that we're having them in front of parks and school zones to for safety. Um, and. Uh, I still hear we've got concerns with uh, Coast Meridian and uh, Pitt River, um, maybe Victoria Drive. There's just, even if that's shared between Coquitlam and Port Coquitlam. Um, and it, it's coming along. We need more reader signs or maybe scarecrow police or, <clears throat> excuse me, or even more police mm. coming and uh, checking if, if they're not too busy and, and stopping uh, the speeders. Yeah, I, don't, uh, I was driving, you know, through Poco, and I, I was thinking I was going like 60, which I thought was, you know, was was the speed limit. But then my son quickly told me that some places along there are 30, so I was, I was technically speeding, and it's it's pretty bad when your your son tells you that you're a speeder. So uh, so sometimes more signs are good, I guess. Um, one of the things that we know about is that outside of um, arts and culture and COVID. 
um, is you sort of uh, w one of the spearheaded behind getting feminine hygiene products mm -hmm. in, in High Creek. I know that that was a big thing for the schools, <laughs> and I, I know. And just a question would be, you know, why that's important, and then is that something that's reflective of having female counselors on council? Thank you for bringing that up. I do recall my interview with you previously. I had mentioned that that was something that I was hopefully trying to bring into the city. And since then, we do have now free period products in, in some, not all, of our restrooms, which we're working towards slowly but surely. But it's made a big difference. And um, also, I worked on um, a resolution that uh, with Dr. Selena Tribe, and it was on period poverty and changing the building code. And these two resolutions went up the ladder through the UBCM and the FCM, uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and right up now into the federal government where um, $25 million is now coming through to be able to finance um, a period products for vulnerable women all over Canada that, that are in like women's shelters or not-for-profits or charities, uh, as well as a period poverty task force. So um, it's something that I never thought um, would turn into so much. So when you say, why do you want, what drives you to be a counselor? Sometimes you don't even know what is there, what path is there, and then once you start um, uh, working on something, it turns into a lot more than you imagined, or changing the building code. Like when you look around, you see, well, why are there urinals in men's washrooms and not products in, in female washrooms? So these sorts of things, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we can change over time. So mm. pr proud to be a part of uh, gender equity, um, changing that uh, landscape. So, so I know that um, when you look at that sort of the, the sort of feminine uh, hygiene products, is that really a reflection of having women on council? I mean, if it was all men, I mean, I'm wondering if they would understand what period poverty is. And, and if you could explain that as well, that would be great. But that's also kind of yeah. how that sort of, I guess, a female balance on council helps bring some of these things up. Sure. So statistically, 50% um, of women at some time in their life have experienced period poverty. Uh, for instance, myself, when I was a university student, I remembered uh, choosing between either a bus pass or getting products. So at, at some point in, in, in your life. So to think that that barrier can be removed, uh, that's what Canada needs to do and that they're driving to do is, is, is make sure that these things come forth. Could it have happened if I was male? I, I'm not sure. Would it have been driven? It might not have been. It was my daughter that came back from one of her games. I don't know if it was hockey or lacrosse. She said, Mom, you know, I went to Port Moody and I went to Coquitlam and they've got free products in their civic facilities. When you go to Poco, you have to pull out a dollar or 50 cents. Like, I said, yeah, no, that, we have to work on that. So that's when I started to work on it. Uh, because we need, uh, we need things looking the same in the Tri-Cities. For, for, and, and for, uh, you know, and for a greater purpose and, and yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, it grew awareness for myself. I mean, I, sometimes, you know, you obliviously as a male, you walk around this world, uh, especially, you know, if you're, you know, sometimes a privileged male, you just, you know, some of these things you're like, what? You know, so I uh, thank you for kind of uh, spearheading it thank and sort you. of enlightening us on, on, on the... You're not the first male that's told me that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. But um, so, so I guess the other one, I know we, um, uh, Council Steve Darling was here and we, and we talked about the Giants and um, it was sold out, but it was, it was, it was kind of, uh, and I, was, I saw the ice and next thing you know, you're coming on the ice as well. So, so how, do, how did, um, I know it was probably exciting. What does it feel like to do that and, and sort of uh, and the importance of you being on that ice, I guess, for that part of the game? I found that bringing that to, to the arena, um, to the John Bailey Stadium, um, was excellent for the community and especially the timing of it all. We had the uh, Coquitlam, uh, uh, pardon me, the, the Legion Honor Guard there and they came onto the ice first, onto the well, red carpet, if you will, and um, uh, it, it was also uh, done shortly after the, the Queen had passed, so we had a minute silence. So it was so good to be in that space. Um, 
and have all of the stands. You, could, you just could drop a pin for, for, for the, the opening. And uh, there were the diff three different flags on the wall. We had the Canadian flag, the BC flag, and the POCO, coat of arms. Yeah. So uh, it, it was very, um, I, I was very honored to be there. I just wish that it, maybe I had a, had a, um, a different jersey on, but at least I had a jersey on. I had a Pirates jersey on. I guess I should have had a uh, um, different one. But uh, No, I, I it, thought the Pirates was perfect, actually, it, to tell you so. I think it was supposed to be a, a predator, you know, so yeah. there was something. I, I, yeah. But it worked out. Yeah. And, uh, well, as long as it's got Poco on it, you're, you're good to go. So. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and uh, some people wore the Giants, which, you know, is, is questionable. But I was uh, secretly hoping for, for Prince George, but I wasn't supposed to tell him <laughs> that out loud. Because coming from Quinnell, yeah. right? Yeah. So that whole thing, though, is sort of like the PCCC, as, it, as it's known in the city, or the Port Quitlam mm -hmm. Community Center, for those who love to use yeah. long words. So, so how does that feel when you sort of, I know a lot of the planning was done before you, you came on council, but, um, uh, but at the same time, you kind of were through that whole process of the construction yes. COVID, and, and then we've got this rink, which is, you know, it's beautiful, uh, and just kind of, is that, was that a cherry on the top for you in that, that moment? I would say that that was huge, um, and, and to to see even now how the residents when they go there, it just changes, um, you know, their whole perspective on Port Coquitlam. Mm -hmm. We're one of the few cities where you don't have to pay to park underground. I went to New West to a, a medical appointment there, it cost me like I think thirteen dollars to park. Mm -hmm. You come here and and it, you don't pay. Uh, so we've got 425 free parking stalls underneath, um, and just everything is state of the art. Uh, it's just, and we've got our artwork on the wall, and the Fraser Valley Regional Library as well, which I'm also on, on sitting on that board, um, representing Port Coquitlam for the Terry Fox Library. Uh, so it's just turned into a huge uh, a center, and we're not finished yet, and, and with the Terry Fox hometown run um, our, our marathon of hope on the back there where we have the uh, um, farmer's market and at some point we'll, we'll have the statue for yeah. Terry so it's still it's still not completed yet yeah but it's a beautiful so, building I agree um, and we've got outside the um, uh, gardens the community gardens mm -hmm. and that's been very good because we've been able to have the uh, seniors and youth within their different programs, team up together and do a garden together. Yeah. So where is it? Is that a new community garden? I wasn't aware yeah, of that. Yeah, it's, it's actually in the back um, on the top there. You'll, you'll be able to see it you know, over where the um, uh, gym, uh, gym equipment is. It's on the other side. So, yeah. so there's a whole bunch of, I mean, the, the, a lot of stuff going on in Poco, but one of the things is uh, I think everybody's concerned about is affordable housing. You know, this market and affordable. Uh, I have two boys, they're living with me, and um, you know, the, the, the saying is the 75,000 is the average mean income, 30% of your salary should not go into, in, you know, should be your rent or mortgage, and, and so I, I feel there's, there's stress, right? So what is, what, is, what is, when you hear the younger folks out there, what do you say to them about affordability and their desire to continue staying in Port Quitlam? I've heard on the doorsteps from parents uh, that have children that they say hey you know what have you done it doesn't seem like you've done anything and I mentioned to them that right now they're not built but they're in different stages of being built are 500 non-market affordable rental units that's a, the biggest infusion I think in many years I think ever in Port Coquitlam for non-market affordable housing so things are being delivered. We've got um, housing for, for, for women, battered women, for, for seniors that, that are being built, uh, for our Metro Vancouver project, and as well as 300 units uh, over in the uh, Gately corridor. So I, I could say, hold on, um, uh, things are coming. Um, we're hoping to change things. We're also working very hard on our, our um, housing strategy. Uh, I was reading that it's. I think we are going to have in the need in the next t ten years five thousand five hundred new units of of different types of uh, apartments or building uh, townhouses, etc. And that would be five hundred and fifty a year. And we're talking, um, you know, 
more like on the affordable scale. So we've got a lot more to do, um, and upping that. Pardon me, it's 500 and uh, pardon me, 5,500 units per year. And of that, instead of them being 10% affordable or non-market, we need to move it up to about 20%. So we need to keep tearing things up because we want to stay ahead. Yeah, is that what you th you believe 20% is the number? I think I think it would be a big help. Yeah, I know I know Coquitlam is 15%, and I think. Port Moody has a number. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's in that that's that twenty percent category. So I think you're probably pretty close. So um, I know, you know, four years ago, um, people were talking about resilient cities, and I always say to everybody, I had no idea what that meant. And then we had a bunch of fires and floods, and and uh, I said to someone, I now know what the Ford in Abbotsford means. You know, I think we all learned it was a lake at one point, and. And so, and so we are seeing this sort of impact. And so how, when you hear those concerns of citizens or air quality, you know, what, what, do you, what do you think about that? So right now, Port Coquitlam's investing 4.3 million in flood protection and climate action. Some things are being worked on right now, such as the, the culvert on um, Burns Road. That's huge because that, that's, that would that's that's necessary in case there's any kind of potential flood. Um, we're working on uh, building the um, um, Cedar Drive pump station as well. Uh, there's quite a few different uh, projects underground as well within the sewer systems, um, and it, it, there it is a big fear. It is a fear, and also. Um, I was also working on a rain garden in Alliance Park. This has to do with storm water. So when there's a lot of like atmospheric rivers and storms, so that the water can then be trapped in rain barrels and then harnessed in there to go and be able to um, water in the garden rather than just going down the drain and getting wasted. And yeah, so there's, there's a few things that are, are smaller things, but they will make a big difference. So we're well on our way to building a climate action plan, engaging the public, getting more feedback. Uh, we've got a lot of smart people out there and uh, we've got a lot of feedback uh, already that we've been working on with um, people that have, have brought in uh, great suggestions. Yeah, uh, I know that um you know, some of the things we, when we did our survey, daycare was a big part for, for some folks. Well, we see it federally and provincially, of course, but so, I mean, you've, the, you know, what, what are we doing? In so, program? if daycare is huge, um, as, uh, I believe with any building that we have, we're building, we need to have daycare in there to accommodate the children that will be in that residence. And I've often thought of maybe doing more tandem projects with the school district, maybe even having more daycares and after, day, after and before care uh, setups within the school system and uh, working more uh, to, to build this because, again, affordability. You don't want to have to think, oh, my daycare only operates from here to here mm. or after school from there to there. Parents get run ragged uh, driving their kids or figuring out where they're going to be taking them. So, Yeah, I heard daycare, I think, uh, uh, I guess the service, but it's, it's mostly the space for daycare, right? I would yes. think that's, a, I was really kind of clueless on that. It was like, you know, $10 daycare sounds great, you know, from a, from a federal perspective, but then where do you have the daycare? And that's kind of what I guess the city can do that or plans to do that. E yes, we could probably try to work more of that in, but right now I don't know of too many $10 a day daycares that, that are in POCO. Mm. Um, that would come more with tandem operations with the provincial government as well. Uh, I know of uh, ones that you can pay like five, six hundred for one child. Mm. So there becomes a point when, you know, you wonder should you maybe, I know when I, I had my four kids, there became a point after three, I thought, well, I better work part time because I'm actually paying daycare more than I'm bringing in, Yeah, you know? So it, it's a hard time. It really is. People are struggling. Yeah. So, so you know, as you as you do, you go through your door knocking process, and you and you meet new, new folks. And I again, I'm that person at the door that doesn't really know who, who Councillor Nancy McCurry is. Who, outside of saying hello, what do you what do you say to them to get their vote? 
Well, I, I, I ask them first uh, if they've got any questions or concerns or anything they want to bring forth. And what I found is that in different areas of the city, they have their different concerns. So you can be over in, in um, more over on, um, let's say, behind uh, Cedar Drive. And anywhere along Prairie, they want that Fremont connector to go in. The traffic volume is getting to be horrendous on Prairie and Coast. So that is a matter of time before this needs to be um, built on, on that side. Then I'll go to another side of town and, and they'll say, well, you know, my driveway um, or my, the, back, the back alley, uh, like they keep coming and they keep like um, putting gravel in, like maybe they should just pave it or put speed humps in it. So uh, you hear different things from, from people in different areas. And uh, um, I think to, I say to them, well, you know, all I know is that I'm, uh, I've been very effective on council. I've brought forth initiatives that um, have been implemented and I would sure love your vote so that I can continue to bring forth positive ideas and initiatives to make Port Coquitlam a better place. Well, I want to thank you for coming in. I know, I know uh, um, well, your signs are everywhere. I know you work hard to get the vote, so I, I wish you all the best in your re-election in your second term. So that's uh, Councillor Nancy McCurr. She's running for re-election in the city of Port Coquitlam for councillor. Uh, if you want to learn more about Councillor McCurr's uh, platform, check out her website. Or if you see her in the street, just uh, wave and say hello. She's pretty friendly. This is Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. Thanks for watching.